we're going to talk to Martin about really what he sees as the opportunities over the next year. He was in the headlines for his prediction of a V-state recession. I don't know if that's changed. You know, the world's changing at such a fast speed at the moment. But let's go and talk to Sir Martin and see what he's got to say. So that's it from me for a bit. Sit back in your armchair or your sofa or wherever you are. Relax, enjoy the amazing content we've got to learn to you today. Thanks for joining us. And now it's over to Sir Martin Sorrell. Sir Martin. Good morning. It's a sunny day. It's a very sunny very day. Very sunny day. So good good background to what you want to talk about in 2021. Exactly. Much sunny having you with us. So let's kick off. You had <laughs> you reported stellar results on Monday. I think everyone was quite amazed. Some people were quite jealous. I loved your quotes. You said that uh, this has been even better compared to the stagnant marketing and advertising industry in which you sit. So what's everyone else getting wrong? I don't know that everybody else is getting wrong, but I, you know, I, I noticed an article in the, I think it was the Wall Street Journal this morning that uh, Forrester is predicting that 52,000 people in the industry will lose their jobs. And uh, you know, if you if you ask me, what do I see as the purpose of S4? Uh, at least in part, if not in whole, it, it is to create opportunities for our people. In the first nine months of this year, we added about 26% to our like for like, that's excluding deals, uh, to uh, the number of people in the company. We're all up, we're up now to just under 3,000 people. Obviously, we're hiring, we've had hiring another 300 people or 10% of our, of our workforce uh, around BMW. And there are some other things to come where we will be hiring another 10%. So we should be up to about 3,300 people as we we enter or in the first quarter of next year. So we're very bullish, but the reason we're bullish is we're in the sweet spot of the economy, the, the digital part of the business. And as you know, Justin, this year, digital was probably flat to up a bit, whereas traditional media was down by 10 or 15%. So the analog companies, and you, you saw yesterday the announcement about fusing, if that's the right word, AKQA mm -hmm. with Gray. I mean, it, it just points... Yes, again, this, uh, this very difficult problem of trying to move an analog business to, uh, to, to a digital business. And when we started S4 two or three years ago, we were lucky. We, the good news was we had a clean sheet of paper. The bad news was we didn't have scale. But we're starting to get our scale and starting to get conversion of scale with, with clients. And digital this year will be 50% of the worldwide spending on advertising media, 550 to 600 billion last year, maybe 500 to 550 billion this year. Next year, it, it, digital will grow by something like 20%. And by 2024, digital will probably be two thirds of the world's global media spending. So uh, the, the prognosis for the digital part of the industry is extremely strong. Just to your your question about, I don't think that people are necessarily doing things wrong. It's just that the tailwind, and when I started S4, I wanted to concentrate where the growth was. The, the tailwind just isn't there in traditional media. Um, you know, to, turning to 2021, I'm very bullish on 21 because we will see that there's a big macroeconomic tailwind. Mm. GDP globally this year is down about 5%. GDP, GDP globally next year will be up 5% or 6%. I think Goldman Sachs forecasted around 6%. So the underlying economy, you know, when was the last time that we saw the world economy growing at mm -hmm. 5 or 6%? The answer is we have to go back a long, long time when inflation was rampant. So I, I think the underlying economy, and then we have obviously the good news around the Pfizer announcement, the Eli Lily antibody announcement. The likelihood we'll have a couple of more vaccines uh, in, in, uh, approved in production, available, and people vaccinated. I would say by Q2 of next year. Uh, I think the winter is going to be very difficult. You referred to Soho being a, a brighter place. I think it's going to be very difficult in the winter months mm -hmm. with the temperatures lower in the northern hemisphere with the virus virulent, new strains of it, you know, amongst the mink population or 
the dead mink population in, in Denmark uh, and elsewhere. I mean, I, it, it is, I think, very serious. Cases, obviously, in America, over 100,000 a day, obviously, what's happening in Western Europe on lockdowns and vir virulent cases as well of the virus. I mean, not good news for the next three, four, five months. But after that, I think when spring comes, I think we, we will see a very, very strong uh, economy, certainly for 21. And I think going into 22, the forecasts for GDP for 22 would be around 3 or 4% growth, which again is strong. So I'm very bullish, maybe because we're in that digital sweet spot and we're, we're built around first party data and digital advertising content and programmatic and performance and we're built around faster, better, cheaper and a unitary structure. But I'm bullish about the prospects for 21 and, and, and for the digital part of the industry. Traditional is going to be tougher. You mentioned there the AKQA and Grey merger, which was something you never would have ever considered going back sort of 10 years ago. It's quite a shocking move. Not the same, I thought, as when Accenture bought Carborama, which again was such an amazing move. You were quoted in an interview last week, I think, saying that Accenture is your real competitor at S4 rather than the big agency network groups. So how does that going to affect how you reshape S4 potentially? Well, uh, our competition, I mean, it's certainly on the BMW pitch, um, it was WPP, it was IPG, it was Dentsu, it was Accenture, and Service Plan and Beryls, uh, who united as well for the pitch uh, uh, against us. And, and in another thing that we're in, involved in currently, Accenture was in the first round and got knocked out in the first round. I would say Accenture, we compete with the holding companies like in the context of BMW, or, or actually one of the tech platforms that we recently won a piece of business from, it was RGA, which I think was the, the digital agency of the second decade of this millennium. I mean, AKQA was the digital agency of the first decade, to your, to your point. Uh, and I think the opportunity for us is that that third decade. But, you know, our competition really in most of the things we have, RGA, huge, AKQA, in the case of the tech platform I'm thinking of. Um, but generally, we really compete head-to-head -head with Accenture and in terms of deals. I mean, in terms of deals, the competition, the holding companies have evaporated from uh, expansion because they're, they're contracting at the moment. They're declining by, in Q3, anything between 5 and 10, 10%. Densu yesterday down about 10% mm -hmm. in Q3. So uh, they're, they're not a force uh, in terms of acquisitions, they may come back again, but it's private equity and Accenture really in both areas. Accenture uh, on the on the pitch front, if you like, uh, and expansion front, and then uh, Accenture and PE on the, on the deals front. And in order to compete effectively, I mean, we're a pimple on the elephant's backside in comparison to Accenture. Accenture is 154 billion market cap. We're $3 billion market cap. We have about $500 million of revenue. They have more than $50 billion. So we're, we're peanuts in comparison. But in order to compete more effectively, we will be building even further our tech capabilities. Tech is about 55% of our revenues. Our whoppers, that's clients over $20 million a year, uh, of the, the top five of the five that we whoppers that we think we will have going into next year, three of them would be tech companies. One would be auto, and one would be FMCG. So, so I think you know our 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 portfolio of clients is much more skewed to tech. And as you will have seen from one of the analysts that follows, we have about seven analysts now following S four. One of them, BNPX, and did a LinkedIn analysis of our people. And our people tend to come from the platforms okay. and from technology. The comparison was to WPP and Publicis. Not more of their people obviously come from the agency networks and the agency holding companies. So the nature of our workforce, the nature of our people, and the recruitment that we're doing at the moment, the 300 to 600 people that we're recruiting in the US and Europe, those people, by their nature, tend to come more from the tech part of the business mm -hmm. uh, and the tech platforms. So people who run our businesses come from Salesforce, they come from Google, they come from Yahoo. They don't come uh, ordinarily from, from the holding company. So very different 
group of people. But systems integration, you know, that will become more and more important for us. We're more on the art side of the business and on the content. Uh, I would say Accenture is more on the science part of the business. They've left their businesses, to your question, relatively unaffected. You know, Droger is separate, the Monkeys is separate, Shackleton is separate, Cole Rebe is separate, Creative Drive is separate. Create some confusion. It's almost like a, a whole co-structure. And I think at some point in time, they're going to have to consolidate those assets. There may be some pain in doing it. You know, we've already seen some pain at Droger and Fjord with headcount cuts. I think uh, Accenture cut about 50,000 people or maybe 25,000 people from their headcount around the world. And that's affected some of their creative assets as well. So, you know, it goes back to your first question. In a way, they have some analog parts to their business as well, which are under pressure given the, 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 the way that the marketplace is developing. What did you mention... Uh network agencies and their problems. We'll talk about that in a second. But in the same article, the, I think it was a campaign article, you said that WPP will always be your baby. <laughs> What's it like sort of looking, yeah. looking at your baby growing without you? Is that a strange feeling? And will you always feel that well, way? It, 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 no, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. You know, I think a lot of what's happening, I think take yesterday's event, if you like. Uh, I, I, I find it, I don't know whether it was because campaign... Uh, got hold of the story, it seemed to be a little bit rushed. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's a bit confusing. I mean, talking to people, you know, last night I got a, a fair number of calls and emails from people at Gray and AKQA. I bet. And, um, you know, there is a great deal of concern. I mean, it was presented to people internally a couple of days ago as being, a, a you know, a, a group event, i.e., AKQA and Gray were going to um, cooperate more. That was the okay. way it was presented. And then, of course, the press release comes out and people are worried that this is a, a takeover, which yeah. has been denied an internal takeover, an internal hostile takeover, I guess is what you would <laughs> describe it, uh, of, of Gray by AKQA. I mean, a lot of people are Gray. I, I think Gray, to be fair... Um, Jim Heakin and Tor Myron. You may remember Tor Myron mm -hmm. left Gray, great creative leader at Gray, to go to Apple, ironically, to become the lead creative uh, at, uh, at Apple. And he's done very well there. And it was, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, a very good move for him. But I think ever since then, Gray was not as strong as it was under Tor and Jim. And I think, you know, Jim is now retired and leaving Michael Houston to run the business. And I think they've had some challenges. But to be fair, I think AKQA has had its challenges too. You know, mm -hmm. Tom Bedekare was was Ajaz Ahmed's partner and a very good balance to Ajaz at AKQA. I remember that well historically. Tom sadly left to become a, a, a lecturer, at, I think, at Stanford University, at Stanford Business School. And he was an outstanding balance to Ajaz. And I think Ajaz has got a big task. I mean, I, I, I think trying to run a global network like AKQA and, uh, and Gray, and I, and I think calling it the AKQA group, you know, is going to be, it creates uncertainty, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, where the last thing you really want is that sort of uncertainty. It creates uncertainty amongst clients, and even more importantly, it creates uncertainty about people. So there has to be quick clarity. There's nothing about the structure other than a Jazz is the CEO and Michael Houston is the COO and president, and everything else will fall into shape. But it, it struck me a little bit like management by spreadsheet and a sort of consulting-type decision without really thinking through the consequences. It, 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 it's not a plan unless all that was intended was we're going to work together. Well, you know, if it was going to be more horizontality, as we used to call it, then fine. But if it's more than that, I think you have to you have to say so. So I think it has caused initially a lot of confusion, but these things always do. And no doubt, it will settle down. Uh, uh, the final thing I would say is when you do things like that, the critical issue is the strength of the leader. So, you know, John Cook at a... VML and a Y&R, Mel Edwards and a Wonderman and Thompson, 
Ajaz Ahmed at a AKQA and Gray. I mean, WPP have lost a lot of very good people. I mean, Nick Emery in, in slightly strange circumstances. Uh, Steve Allen. Can I ask you a view, on, can I ask you a view on, on that, on Nick Emery's departure? Well, listen, I say Nick has spent 23 years of his life uh, building up Mindshare from scratch, you know, with Dominic Proctor and others, it is true, uh, and was a, a great leader of Mindshare, just like Steve Allen was a great leader of Mediacom. Uh, you know, I understand Steve chose to go. It, it was different with Nick. Uh, I don't know the, the detailed circumstances uh, of Nick, but it seems to me that, you know, to be blunt, there was a, a bit of an agenda there too. Okay. The Christian Jewel at Group M wishes, wished to execute change and, and didn't want people of, let me put it like this, independent persuasion. Okay. <laughs> they didn't want okay. any people of independent persuasion there. You know, people who would say, you know, I think you have to surround yourself not with yes men or yes women. You have to surround yourself with people who are prepared to to fight their corner. That can sometimes be difficult and difficult to manage, but good people are difficult to manage. Average people are easier to manage, which is a dangerous thing to say because average people, in order, in order to make themselves think they're good, become difficult. So it defeats the purpose. But um, no, I think it's um, it will be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Uh, you know, obviously it's an approach. But I think it's more, as I said, management by spreadsheet and very much a consultancy approach. The devil in all these things is in the detail. And what you've done overnight is created uncertainty amongst 6,000 people. OK, let's talk a bit briefly about network agencies in general. You know, you mentioned management by spreadsheet, etc. They've got the problems not letting independent thinking flourish. But are they still too bloated to survive? And what does 2021 hold for the networks, do you think? Well, you, you know, you talk about bloated. I mean, again, talking to, to people at the holding companies, they complain bitterly, you know, without naming names, but you can guess who these are, about the, the increasing uh, size of HR departments at the centre, financial departments at the centre, new business departments at the centre, client management departments at the centre, and the, the addition of overhead, which then feeds back to pricing, because when you price... You know, a time of staff contract with a procurement department, for example, you have direct costs, you have indirects, which includes overhead. So, you know, if you have sitting in London a big HR department of 100 people or 80 people, big finance departments, and then at a subgroup level, you know, at a Group M level, for example, you have another set of HR and finance and new business. And then at an agency level, you have another set. Obviously, you have you have challenges. And uh, I think with all the holding companies, that, that is the problem they're wrestling with. Uh, Omnicom, you know, is going through great difficulty as well in Q2. But I think if you look at the detail at the numbers, it's interesting what Omnicom have done because they've made very heavy provisions in Q2 in their financials. And my guess would be, looking at the financials, they will emerge probably the strongest financially from, from the slowdown because I think John Wren you know, has got a very strong financial head on his shoulders. And, and I think he came to the conclusion that Q2 was a write-off anyway, so you might as well make it a basket case. So you, 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 you make heavy provisions against property. They provided against a million square feet. IPG pro provided against half a million square feet in Q2. So... I, I think the holding companies, and next year, the holding companies should grow. I mean, if you can't grow against Q2 of, of this year, next year, you never will. I mean, with GDP up 5%, I mean, you should, you know, if you if you dropped 15% to 20% or 10 to 20% in Q2 of this year, you know, you have the, the comparables for Q2 of next year, you know, are next to nothing. So... If you can't grow next year, you never will. So that's why I think I think 20, 2021, you know, to my mind, 2021 is like 2010. Uh, 2010, if you remember, I do. We, we had the tarps. Paulson was negotiating the tarps with Congress up until March of 2009. They implemented the tarps. And 2010 was a, a better year on the upside because you took the cost actions in 2009. Of course, in America, you can take cost actions far faster 
than you can uh, in uh, in Western Europe. In Western Europe, you know, we were restructuring Western Europe into 10, 11, 12, because, you know, the, the costs of doing it are very high and it's a much more, uh, much more fixed cost uh, environment. So I think 2021 is really, you know, to all the people on this this call or you're listening or watching, if, if there is anybody out there, um, you know, I think, I think 2021, you know, really, we, we have an opportunity and it's going to be very unpleasant, I think, for the next three or four months. But beyond that, when the vaccines and the vaccines, you know, the Russian vaccine has been launched, the Chinese vaccine is being tested in Brazil, somewhat controversially, but it's being tested in Brazil. So I feel... You know, much more optimistic about the environment, maybe with the qualification that the next three or four months are going to be difficult, generally. I think for S4, we'll have a strong fourth quarter. We have more good new client business news coming through. Uh, we'll be hiring more people. You know, we've gone against the trend, so I feel very bullish about it. But um, I think now is the time, and you, you said it in your preamble, now is the time to plan for, you know, unplugging, if I can put it that way, uh, as you go into 2021. So I think this it, it, 2021 could be huge. Good news. Now, we've only got a few minutes left. Give me, if you would, your top three bits of advice to any CMO as they try to merge stronger and go into 2021. Well, it's, it's tough. Um, I, I mean, firstly, agility, I think, is absolutely critical. I mean, we're building... S4 around agility. That's the positioning. We are the agile, agile partner of record, <coughs> not agency of record, partner of record uh, for clients. So agility is absolutely key. Clear vision and you know, well networked enterprise, rapid decision making, rapid response. Uh, you know, strong diversity. I mean, all those things that, that I think make a modern corporation. So agility, number one. Secondly, first-party data. Focus, you know, the, the, the pressures on third-party cookies from Google, the same from Apple in terms of their hardware, forcing clients to use their first-party data to do the basics, you know, make sure the data pools talk to one another, the lakes, you know, are, can, can flow together, if that's the right analogy, uh, and and then I think the third thing is marketers have to take back control. You 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 have to run the the the, the pendulum switch switched to outsourcing uh, it, after 2010 because of co reducing costs in a 24/7 always on digital environment. CMOs have to control data, control content, and co control media distribution. Now, it doesn't have to be in-housing. It can be an embedded model, but it has to be, you talked about personalization at scale. That's, I think, the theme of today. You know, when we do, when we apply the Netflix model, Mark Pritchard, I think, is applying the Netflix model to Procter & Gamble. And Procter & Gamble are having extraordinary success, you know, up 9% in their product categories to up 9% in the last quarter is huge. Unilever, up 4%. You, they're making very significant gains in a in a very difficult economic environment. So they have product portfolios that maybe suit, in a way, the coronavirus environment. But I would say those are the three things, agility, first-party data, and take back control. I mean, the days, unfortunately, finance and procurement have forced marketing down the, down the ladder. Uh, and I think we have to reestablish particularly in an online environment. You know, what COVID has done is accelerate. It hasn't created anything new in my view. Not on the working side. You know, we were going to do more work from home. We were going to do more work remotely. We were going to live more remotely and more, more distanced. We were going to commute on a more varied basis. We were going to do more online education. We were going to do more online financial services or more online gaming and in-home entertainment more online shopping for necessities and groceries. You know, one third of America, mm. U.S. households during the pandemic have gone online for groceries and essentials yeah. for the first time. Media was going to increasingly become digital, newspapers and magazines, uh, free-to-air under pressure from streamers, on online 
uh, out of home billboards being better than traditional billboards. And lastly, enterprise digital transformation acceleration. All those things were going to happen anyway. What COVID has done has just accelerated it even more. So we're going to see we're going to see more of that. Uh, and uh, I think 2021 will also be, you know, the year of accelerated, even more accelerated digital transformation. So the, 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 the interest that we've seen in technology and healthcare and in-home entertainment and online education and online communication and online financial services is going to intensify. Those V-shaped sectors are really going to be the ones that benefit. Amazing. So, Martin, thank you so much. It's always a complete pleasure, honour to spend time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.